Hey everybody, welcome to Amanda Marie and Pior on my channel. I'm on a journey getting my family nurse practitioner. And if you are on a similar journey, you may find this slice show pretty helpful. We're going to be studying integumentary or the derm system here. And all of my references will be provided for you in the description box below. So I have some awesome ways for you to remember these basic skin, these terminology, the word and what they are and how to differentiate. I had a friend who recently took the ANCC. She had one derm type question on her entire exam. And it was actually these terms put into a drag and drop format. So it's very important that we know. So here's the words to know. We have a furuncle, which is also a boil or an abscess, and it's a deep infection of the hair follicle. Then we have a boule, which is a blister, and this is fluid filled. And this is just a simple way to remember, and then I'll go into the tips and tricks. A vesicle is also fluid filled. We have nodule, papule, and plaque, and those are all solid lesions. Our macule is the flat change in color. And then lastly, a wheel, which is what we know to be hives and that is a flat lesion. So think to yourself, 888, what do we hate? Derm. <laughs> Derm can just be so overwhelming, but hopefully these tips and tricks will help you. And I put this in a system so that you could maybe put this on your dump sheet at boards if you chose to, if you're really struggling with differentiation between the terms. So you can write out all eight. That's how you'll remember that there are eight main skin words that you need to know here. So F, furuncle, F, follicle. So that's how you'll be able to remember which area of the skin that the furuncle impacts. B, bulla. Remember, B is for big blister. So bulla is the bigger fluid-filled lesion of the two. And then vesicle, you're going to remember V for very, very small fluid-filled blister. And then you're going to think nodule which is a solid lesion. So I put in bold here the NO in nodule and the SO in solid so that you can remember, oh no, it's so big. So this is gonna be a solid lesion that is the larger one, that's our nodule. And then our papule, you'll see that I put in bold the PU. So papule, PU, and then PU in the word puny, and then LE and little and LE in the lesion. So papule, puny, little, solid lesion. So we mainly have two fluid fill, right? We have the bulla and the vesicle. B for big, V for very small, and then nodule is solid, papule is solid, and then plaque. You're instantly going to think P for psoriasis, plaque, psoriasis, and we're just going to know what that looks like, and that's a solid lesion. And then for MAC, you'll see I tried to make a little bit of a saying here. So the M, the C, F, C, I, C. Macule is flat, change in color, which stands for moms can have funny changes in color. And each letter at the beginning of each one of those words is going to prompt you that macule is flat and it's a change in color. Moms can have funny changes in color. And then W for wheel and H for hives way up high. So Hives meaning way up high, meaning like angioedema, meaning an allergic reaction. That's typically when we see that IgE mediated response, you um, tend to see hives with that. So go ahead and screenshot this if you want to, whatever works best for you. You're also going to find a printable copy of all of these slides in the description box below. You can print them out and put them in your NP binder and study from these. Again, I think that you're going to find them very, very helpful. So now we're just going to hit on some of the highly talked about must know skin conditions. And of course we see the first one is impetigo. When you hear impetigo, I want you to think honey crusted lesions. I want you to think mere Pearson cream, which is also Bactroban. And again, I have a little um, mnemonic here for you. I have crusted lesions must have Bactroban. And you can see the I in impetigo or impetigo, the H honey, C crusted, L lesions, and mu piercerin, and B bactroban. I have crusted lesions, must have bactroban. So that's how my brain works. If you're getting any value out of this video at all, go ahead and hit the like button and continue watching. I've got tons more content for you here. That's really going to be helpful. Now let's differentiate between the two different types of cellulitis. So when we think cellulitis, we need to ask ourselves, is this purulent, meaning that it has pus or is it non-purulent, which means there is no pus. So there's some words with cellulitis that you just kind of need to know, warm 
indurated and firm. So if we're doing a physical assessment and we're touching the skin, we can see that it looks hot. So we need to know that it's going to feel warm to the touch and it's going to be indurated, meaning you're going to be able to palpate and feel where the margins are and it's going to feel firm to the touch. So you're going to see another saying in this one. And this one says, I see you have C, you need a C. So for cellulitis, it starts with C. We're going to stick with those Cs. I see you have a C, so you need a C. That's just supposed to help you to remember that the treatment for cellulitis is going to begin with a C. We're going to be treating this with either cephalexin, which is Keflex, which is our first generation cephalosporin, or we're going to use cefdroxil or clindamycin. So I've included some good pictures here for you, and you will definitely note the one clear to the right here of the eye and that cellulitis cellulitis, the prairie orbital cellulitis, you're just going to need to know, obviously, that that is a medical emergency. So that was our non-purulent. In comparison, cellulitis, which has the pus or that is purulent cellulitis, we're going to think MRSA. That's, that's a word we just need to know. It can be staph but most of the time. It is specifically uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And again, treatment is the same. I see you have a C, but with purulent our saying is going to end with, you need an IND. I see you have a C, you need an IND. So if there's pus about, get it out. That is one of the Amelie Ollier, um, just key phrases. So treatment for this is going to be Bactrim. And I don't know about you, but when I think about Bactrim, I think urinary tract infections, because that used to be one of our go-to antibiotics, and it still is and can be used for urinary tract infections. However, that was recently, fairly recently, um, noted that this is actually a really great antibiotic for these types of skin infections. So treatment can be Bactrim, clindamycin, tetracycline, um, and then the linzolid for five to 10 days. So I've also included some nice pus-filled pictures for you. Just wanna make sure that you can truly differentiate between the two. And just as a reference, I'll go back here and remind you, I see you have a C, so you need a C. We need to be thinking about cephalexin, cephaldroxyl, and clindamycin. And then if there is pus present, if there's pus about, we need to get it out. So we're going to do an IND. I see you have a C, you need an IND. So I hope that those little mnemonics and uh, tips and tricks are helpful to you in your studying. And throughout this presentation, I threw together some fun facts. I just thought that it was interesting that 85% of cellulitis occurs on the lower leg. So we know we can have the periorbital cellulitis, but most of the time we're going to be seeing that on the lower legs. So our next skin condition we're going to talk about is folliculitis, and this occurs in hair-bearing skin. Um, it's an inflammation of superficial or deep portion of the hair follicle. So you see here on the back of the neck, um, the hair follicles are infected, and then as well as above the chin where the gentleman shaved, he has some folliculitis, which is pretty significant. And the treatment for this is going to be oral Keflex. Next up, as far as derm goes, I want to talk to you about anaphylaxis. We know that this is severe and that it is life-threatening and that it's an actual emergency. It's caused by an IgE-mediated response. This can happen for various reasons, such as reaction to foods, insects, and drugs. But the main cause you need to know in the outpatient setting is food allergies. So when we think about anaphylaxis, we need to think and talk about the signs and symptoms that we're going to see. So this picture is a very good representation of the angioedema in full swing. Um, the signs and symptoms is that it's going to be an acute onset. You're going to see flushing and hives. Again, that angioedema, dyspnea, wheezing, tachycardia, or bradycardia, hypotension, hypoxia, and cardiac arrest. Again, this is a very emergent type situation. And the treatment is going to be epinephrine, one milligram per mil. You're going to administer 0.3 to 0.5 IM. This is going to be given in the mid to outer thigh and can be repeated every five to 15 minutes. And you're going to want to call 911. Of course, we're worrying about the airway with anaphylaxis. 
Next up in our Durham talk, we're going to touch on Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and there are going to be some focus words for you. When you see these words, you're supposed to know Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. North Carolina is one of the typical states that's mentioned, if there is a state mentioned. Um, and at the end, I'll go over a few more with you. But Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, you should think tick bite and then rash on the palms and the soles. And this is actually an emergency as well, it needs to be treated right away. There are some signs and symptoms other than that rash, such as high fever, chills, severe headache, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, myalgia, arthralgia, that's followed by that rash about two to five days later, and then petechiae, which is going to be that rash on the wrist, forearms, and ankles. And think rash on the feet specifically. This rapidly progresses toward the trunk until it's just a generalized full widespread rash. And approximately 10% of people don't actually get a rash with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which I thought that to be pretty interesting. Most cases of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever occur during April to September, so like the spring to summer timeframe. And more cases are seen in males specifically Native Americans and age 40 and above. And very important to note that higher mortality if not treated within that first five days. And how do we treat this? Doxycycline, that is our first line treatment. More than 60% of cases occur in the five states that I have listed here for you on the screen, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Alaska, Tennessee, and Missouri. And the big red arrow is pointing to adults and children. And this is to remind you that with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, regardless of allergy, we are using doxycycline. That is the go-to treatment because the good outweighs the bad, so to speak. And then just kind of a side note, the use of deep containing repellent and permethrin on clothing and gear can repel dog and deer ticks. Okay, friends, that successfully wraps up dermatology part one. If you're getting enjoyment out of these videos, if you're learning something, share them with a friend. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to give this video a big like and go to the description box below. I'm doing a giveaway right now and February 1st, five lucky winners will be announced here on the channel. And there's a free printable and directions on how to join the private Facebook group. I can't wait to see you next week here on the channel.